Good day and welcome to another segment of In the Spotlight. I'm Superintendent Michael Richard, and today I'm pleased to be joined by two veteran teachers from West Springfield High School, uh, our very own Stan Savek and Sean Theraldson. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Thank you very much for having us here. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, always a little bit of an easy question to get us going, and we're going to get a little harder. Ooh. The rigor is going to ramp up. <laughs> <all> <laughs> okay, the that's why you were here. That's it. But just to start, why don't you tell the folks at home a little bit about yourselves, where you come from, how long you've been in West Springfield, that kind of wow. thing. Stan, you're, you're up. 1969, I started kindergarten <laughs> here in West Springfield, and it's been uh, a ride now. I've been teaching, uh, I graduated in 82, been teaching since 87. That's where I did my student teaching, and then I subbed for a year or so and got into the high school and uh, worked at the middle school after for a time and then came back to the high school. So I've been around the town and, and enjoyed my, my stint extensively. Yeah. Very good. And Sean? Also born and raised in West Springfield, born in 1965 on March 3rd. My parents were teachers. My mom was a teacher at the old Park Avenue school. My dad was a teacher here at the high school. He taught power mechanics and auto shop. And uh, I started in business. And then from business, I went into um, teaching. Went into teaching when I was about 35 years old. Studied history, studied filmmaking and um, politics and then work from that point on and came back to West Springfield High School. So Sean, this might be an easy question <laughs> for you. Be, I, I really wanted to know what's the inspiration for becoming an educator? It sounds like it was, it was in the family. It, 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 it was at the table, I mean, every day. I mean, my parents, my, 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 both my mom and dad were phenomenal people. Um, they were wonderful parents. Uh, they were professionals and they were teachers. And I've always said it takes a teacher to make a teacher. And I learned how to be a teacher at home. And that's uh, a testament to both my mom and my dad. Um, and they had different skills, they had different abilities, and they instilled that love of learning and, uh, in us. And uh, it carried all, all the way through. Uh, and I'm 53 years old now, and so wow. it's always been from, yeah. I won't be asking yeah. you for the last four digits <laughs> of your social security number. <laughs> <laughs> but, or his AARP. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there you go. Uh, Stan, how about you? Um, as Sean was saying, I grew up in West Springfield uh, in a military family. My father was over at Westover Air Force Base, and from the earliest moments of my childhood, we were talking about the Romans and the Vikings, and, and it hit, you know, South Africa invades Angola, 1974. It's <laughs> rooted in my mind, you know, and um, so it was part of my family heritage and culture to talk about history all the time and be into it, and I kind of I had no idea I wanted to be a teacher until I was around 20, 21 years old. And three quarters of the way through my degree program at Westfield State, which was in art and history. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you know what? Maybe I'll try teaching. And I haven't looked back since. But right. I do recognize my father and uh, my family as my great inspiration. Sure, sure. You've got a tremendous uh, ins well, influence in this community uh, regarding the Civil War. Tell me a little bit about <laughs> your your interest in the Civil War, where that, that, that it, comes from and, and, and how you are translating that to the students in the classroom. It's weird because it seems like an easy question that you're asking me, but it's a hard one because I had to do a lot of reflection about why I'm interested in the Civil War. I, mean, I had a, a course in, in high school, a military history with this, this veteran of World War II named George Bozen. I remember we got into the, the Civil War there. But um, it wasn't until college when a friend of mine and I were on a tour of some of the battlefields in the, the northern part of the, the, the south, the former Confederacy. We were down in Antietam, which is in, in Maryland, and we were captured by, uh, <laughs> we, we got to the battlefield at like 8.30 at night. It was getting dark in September, and we got captured by some reenactors. They, <laughs> you know, jokingly captured us and brought us into their tents. And uh, that kind of, you know, I guess I had been into the Civil War a lot prior, but that kind of really activated me around the idea of living history and reenacting. And, and I now am part of several different living history organizations. We have a little living history band that I am the, uh, like the front man for. We go all over New England and perform. Um, and I get the kids involved. Some of the kids, uh, some, uh, we're down at the Ramapog Historical Society, which takes care of the old day house. Um, we have living history festivals down there all the time. We're going to do a big event this year uh, commemorating uh, the 100th anniversary of Susan B. Anthony's great accomplishment, uh, the, the 19th Amendment, right? So we're all excited about bringing the kids into that. Right. And uh, I can go on and on about it, but it's a, it's a way to bring history to life for me and then just 
by my nature, I try to connect the kids with it and anybody else that's interested. And by the way, out there in West Springfield, I need some help. <laughs> Down there on that Ramapak Historical Society, we're running low on uh, active members. So if anybody's interested in joining me, I promise you'll be entertained. Okay, well, we, we should use this quick opportunity so we can let people know how should they contact you if they are interested in, in helping out. Oh, thanks, out. Mike. You see, very pragmatically asking me how to contact S-V-E-C at WSPS.org will get you right to me and I'll get right back to you. And um, we'd love to have you, whether you just want to explore the Ramapog and the old day house, mm -hmm. Or you want to be a full full member on the board of directors? We need people in that. Great capacity. volunteerism is, is huge. Yeah. Sean, you you've been teaching a number of subjects here at mm -hmm. the high school for a long time. World history was was your thing. Right, you've right. recently moved on to things like advanced placement European history. Right, right. Um, how has that experience, AP Euro particularly, changed your approach to, uh, to the classroom? The change uh, in my approach and and the new and the new pedagogies that I've learned started when I created my own comparative religion course here at the high school. It was the first time that was ever taught. And from that experience of creating my own course from scratch, from the grassroots up, I, thanks to this guy here, I, um, I, I, I moved into AP Euro history and I began a, a real study in recapturing what I originally went to school for. Back then it was called Western Civ and that's what I majored in. So teaching European history now, AP Euro history, is like a, it's like a coming home uh, motion for me. It is recapturing the medieval world, recapturing the early modern world, all of those things that I excelled at in college when I met a phenomenal professor of Russian uh, and Slavic studies, Miriam Shaikovich, and she completely changed the way. She's one of the reasons, beside my parents, that I became a teacher, and it is a testament to her uh, and every year uh, I come into the building uh, when I first start and I write her initials in the upper left hand corner of my um, whiteboard and it stays in the very last day I erase it. And it's a testament to her uh, instilling this love of European history. And like Stan and I, we come from European families and so it's, it's a return home. For sure. So since both of you have started teaching, <clears throat> it has evolved uh, greatly and the way that we uh, present material. We've gone from a, a teacher-centered classroom to a student-centered classroom. Tell me a little bit about the strategies that you use to engage students um, in, your, in your instruction and, and then talk a little bit about how technology has become part of what you do uh, as teachers in the classroom. Stan, why don't you start? Starting way back with the chalk and the, the blackboard, um, I, I, I had success and I think that probably the biggest reason for that was being present. You know, I'm always there. I'm not thinking about something else. I'm thinking about the kids in front of me and what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And, we're, and it's a shared moment of fun and exploration. I'm constantly learning from them as I'm teaching them because of the questions that they ask. And if you run a Socratic style classroom where you're actually listening to the questions they ask and you're trying to you know, rephrase and redirect, it's not boring. Even if you're doing five of the same classes every day, every class is different. As we've moved on into the world of technology, I'd, I'd be running around the classroom holding up books and showing them pictures because I think bilateralization, visual images, mm -hmm. is really important. Now I've got it, I, and we went to the, you know, the overhead projector and showing them images that way, and then we, we, we went to the, the smart board and the bright link, and, and I can now project images that I gather off the Internet so these kids are like completely engaged in, in the visual and the auditory side of it, and if they've got Chromebooks like they do in mm -hmm, West Springfield mm -hmm. now, they're sharing their finds with me. And with some of this new technology, I was saying to you earlier, Mike, you can get these uh, GoPro knockoff video cameras off Amazon for 20 bucks, and I'll send those home with kids and have those, you know, those cameras used to create awesome reports and, and awesome opportunities to explore the world of history and the, the direct local connection with West Springfield history vis-a-vis -vis Bear Hole, the old homes and the old neighborhoods in town. We had a guy uh, working in the library a few years ago that did a thing with me where the uh, Historical Commission gave us more than 7,000 pictures from West Springfield across its history and we put those online so that they're available on historypen.com so you can see if you own a particular property the earliest extant picture of that property and that was all done through technology and through the hard work of students here at West Springfield. 
So, I mean, there, there's so many opportunities. You mentioned years ago to me a, a, a technique called flipping, where what we do is we take video and uh, we, rather than showing it in the classroom, we'll have the kids watch it at home through technological um, methods, you know, using YouTube or using embedded video in a, in a computer form called Google Forms. Kids will watch the video at home and they'll answer a question, come into class ready for a Socratic discussion so I can get more bang for my buck, more time on learning, right. which is really what we try to do here. If you're, you like what you're doing, you're looking for the opportunity to steal the show. Absolutely. Sean's looking for an opportunity. I know. I'm going on. Sorry. Sorry. And, and this is fantastic because I want to add one thing to what Stan has said because I've known Stan for over 40 years now. And what people don't realize is that Stan and I in our early years, um, I never knew Stan as a, as a history guy. I knew Stan as an artist, a sculptor, uh, someone who was an artist. And that reflects, I believe, in our teaching. Teaching is not just a job for Stan and I. Teaching is an advocation. It's something that rings a chord or strikes a chord at a very, very deep level of who we are as human beings, as humanitarians. And it has teaching for us, I think. And as wild and crazy guys. It, 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 wild and crazy guys <laughs> from Europe. Uh, it, and there is this element of art that is involved, the actual process of teaching communication and just like you have to communicate with the subjects that you are are drawing painting and stand sculpting i remember you were a phenomenal sculptor in high school and college um, you have to do that in teaching too you have to reach out you have to make those connections because you're really shaping minds it's like an artist with clay and you are you are shaping ideas um, philosophies attitudes and so it's just not academics it's everything that is uniquely human. And that's why I think it's so fantastic to be a teacher, because you are an artist. You are an artist of words, of meaning, and of human life. History has and its own muse. It does, it does. And the technology <laughs> just allows us to undo that. And it's, it, it's a little bit strange that you go from this very personal element of teaching to all of a sudden, technology and what it can provide for you and it can open up the entire world and it can open up communications between students and teachers and um, a lot of the things that Stan has said we use them in our classroom flipping classrooms but also just transposition of knowledge you know taking a picture of something that the kids did sending it out to the kids and then having them critique it have them add to it give it back to you, send it back to you, and this constant kind of feedback loop of human technology, which is an imprint of our mind. It's an imprint of our creativity, and it's an imprint of our history. And that's why I think technology is really essential for the, for the teaching of history. Well, the fact that you're both here today really is a testament to, uh, to how you have influenced and impacted the lives of, of students, because indeed you're here uh, because, because students said your names as uh, individuals that they would like to see uh, featured on the spotlight. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, what's, what's one thing that you would want your students to remember you for? Um, what's the, you know, how, do, how would you like to be recalled uh, by students? So when you, when you think about your, um, your college professors, I want students thinking about their high school teachers. Mm -hmm. and, and so when somebody thinks Sean Theraldson, What's going what's gonna to come to mind? Blue-eyed Viking. That's it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, yeah. Blue-eyed Viking. Thor. Uh, <laughs> Thor, yeah. Um, I was compassionate. I made a connection. I was someone that students could trust. I was someone that students could look up to. And that's at the end of the day when I leave the door and I close the door, I ask myself, did I achieve that? Was I someone that helped a student out who was really, really in need? Because I believe in that concept of helping people out who are in need. And some of our students are in need. And those are the people that I want to be remembered for helping. Very good. I, I would agree with that and, and also like that to be something kids remember me for. But I think uh, the notion of doing things in this world. We live in this world where we vicariously enjoy sports. We, we, we sit back and we live our lives through others. And I want to see kids getting out mm -hmm. and exploring, traveling, whether it be going fishing or hiking or hunting or going to a museum or 
coaching or you know being part of this this big world and that's kind of something I try to model with them whether I'm bringing them on a field trip or sharing uh, imagery that that can make them promote traveling someday you know when they're in college and they don't have anything else to worry about in their life <laughs> but but that so you know they can think of me in in years to come as the guy that that motivated them to be just yeah. be go out and do and well, when they're in college, I hope they are, uh, if they're getting captured, that it's not by the authorities, but perhaps <laughs> by reenacting uh, the teams yeah. at Antietam. Yeah. Uh, so last question, guys. Uh, you know the drill. Who would you like to see uh, featured in the spotlight? And, and order doesn't indicate importance. Whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this, and I have a couple of friends in the administration in the elementary school. Uh, Donna Calabrese and Diane Doe, who are both West Side uh, girls, like Sean and I are West Side guys, and I've had some good connections with them over the years. I think they'd be interesting on the show, showing, uh, from, as we're trying to show from a teaching perspective, from an administrative perspective, you know, what it's like to, to have started your career in West Springfield and you're... Sure. And Moving continuing on. it. How about yeah. you, Sean? This is an easy one. Michelle Pelletier. Okay. I love Michelle. She's just phenomenal. Phenomenal teacher, phenomenal humanitarian. And I would like to see her up here uh, taking the reins from Stan and I and sitting here and having a chance to talk with you and everything. She has so much to share. She's a wonderful person, and she's just a joy to be around, and I'd like to see her up here. All right, very good. Well, we're going to add them to the list. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this segment of In the Spotlight. It's been a pleasure to sit with Stan and Sean, and I look forward to seeing you in a future episode. Thank you.